So the 1920s are a fascinating decade in American history. 1920 is the first year in which the United States is designated a majority urban nation on the census. Uh, it's a time of tremendous demographic change in American cities and American regions. Uh, and it's a time of cultural flourishing. We think of the Roaring Twenties uh, in New York City where we're sitting, the Harlem Renaissance. What role do women play, these newly uh, empowered women play in these, uh, these cultural movements? One of the most exciting things about the 1920s is just watching how women you might say they explode in, with energy and excitement at just having the vote. It's not that they use the vote particularly, but that they become women in the way in which we recognize them. So no longer the sort of secondary subservient and so on, but people in their own right doing their own thing. So for example, we notice almost immediately that the clothing women wear changes dramatically. Uh, you know, that the long dresses and the long skirts and the, you might say, almost dowdy appearance of, you know, even, you know, young active women in the pre-war period gives way by the early part of the 1920s to skirts that get shorter, get shorter and shorter and then finally just barely cover the knee. Uh, undergarments, especially corsets, are reduced to a minimum. Corsets are pretty much gone. Uh, the shape of the body, you know, the ideal shape has moved from the hourglass shape, you know, which of course required tightening up pieces of one's body with uh, the undergarments and laces. Uh, and that's now disappeared and the straight, we would call it the twiggy, body has emerged. You can see women's legs, you can see their knees, you can see their uh, bare arms and so on. The, the hair gets cut short, so the chignon, the hair wrapped around the head, uh, disappears in favor of bobbed hair or short hair. And women's appearance, therefore, is dramatically, just on its face, freer. Now, you know, that's part of a much larger sense of who women are. And you can see that sense everywhere. Uh, one thinks about the silent movies, for example, and Lillian Gish, uh, you know, who both plays the ingenue and the sort of vulnerable young woman who nevertheless has a kind of strength and who is herself a movie producer and who manages to, uh, you know, both be a great star and to cultivate a studio herself. Uh, you can see it in the romance of the movie industry and the way women flock to the movie industry. Uh, you can see it in uh, automobile culture, uh, the notion that, uh, you know, as in the movies where you can actually sit and be an audience in the dark with a guy, you know, that's a big change from the pre-war period to the automobile where you could actually go take a ride to a place where there was no parent or chaperone watching you and return from that place an hour or more later and who knows what you would have been doing. Um, you know, there's, a, there's a, a palpable freedom, I'd have to say. And I'd also have to say that that expresses itself sexually, that suddenly um, from a, a, you know, a, a relatively, um, a, a, you know, tight, uh, uh, supervised uh, uh, fear of losing one's virginity, it becomes not exactly appropriate to have sex before marriage, but it's no longer as frowned upon as it used to be. So in all kinds of ways, uh, the 
flapper image and flapper life reflects a kind of new freedom among women. Could you tell us more about flappers, who they were, what the flapper lifestyle entailed, how it was viewed? Well, l let me uh, tell you a little bit about the flapper by using one of my favorite examples, Lillian Hellman, uh, who we remember now as a rather famous and sometimes dark playwright of the 1930s and 40s, but who, born in 1905, came of age in 1925, uh, went to college for a year or so, came from a modest middle-class uh, family, uh, you know, did a year or two of college and then dropped out of college and took a job in a publishing house where at the age of 20 or so, she is already partying, uh, drinking, uh, which uh, though alcohol is now illegal in the 20s, it is widely available nevertheless in private kinds of places, uh, where she stays out all night, where she smokes, uh, where she expresses her own opinion freely uh, and where she is economically independent. So though she continues to live with her parents until she marries, the money she earns is her own. Uh, she spends it on clothes, on, uh, you know, leisure kinds of uh, activities. And she, she represents herself as the kind of quintessential, uh, irresponsible, somewhat flighty, somewhat flaky, uh, unconcerned with deep political kinds of things, uh, but otherwise uh, completely uh, autonomous and independent soul. And she can remain a flapper until she marries. But after marriage, of course, there then is a question about whether the lifestyle that she had adopted before marriage can and should continue. Now, in Lillian Hellman's case, she actually continues the lifestyle. Uh, but that's frowned upon. So. You know, while people are rather indulgent of the flapper lifestyle uh, before marriage, uh, after marriage, uh, it's not quite so uh, uh, acceptable. I have to say that there are versions of the flapper lifestyle in the African American uh, community, and again, they are somewhat different because women have had a somewhat, especially middling, when women of the middling sort have had a somewhat more autonomous uh, and independent lifestyle than have uh, white, respectable, middle class women. Uh, but in the black community, it manifests itself in a flowering of cultural uh, energies and activities. Uh, so, you know, one thinks, for example, immediately of uh, Zora Neale Hurston, for example, who comes to Barnet in the early uh, 1920s on the scholarship. Uh, one thinks of the Harlem Renaissance and of the women who become both the partners of men, but also poets and novelists and so on in their own right. And one thinks of the way in which in the 1920s, uh, women's capacity to uh, support and sustain not only their own lifestyles, but also the lifestyles of their families, uh, becomes part of the, the particular flapper image in the African American community. Well, and you're reminding me of one of the central tenets of our course, which is that a focus on women in work simultaneously allows us to understand significant and well-known moments in American history differently. So in this case, to understand that there is a, a real gender politics and a real woman presence in the Harlem Renaissance.
Yeah, that, that's, that's a really good point to make, and I'm glad you made it, because of course that's true of flappers in general, but women in particular. So now, you know, before when we've talked about wage earning women, we've talked about women of relatively limited means uh, for the most part some exceptions of course but for the most part and we've talked about work itself as um, something somewhat out of the ordinary for the middle uh, middling kind of women and not respectable for and not desirable for african-american or for white women but now in this flapper period work becomes part or can become part of a woman's self-image, whether that woman becomes a novelist or an anthropologist as Zora Neale Hurston started out, or like Lillian Hellman, you know, a young woman who starts out as a clerk in a, in a um, literary enterprise and ends up uh, being a famous novelist herself. It's that all kinds of women are now imagining work, creative work, satisfying work, um, the sense of themselves as workers, you know, as, as people with something to contribute beyond and outside of the household roles, even beyond and outside of the extended household roles. Uh, that's the big transition in the 1920s. I couldn't help but think when you mentioned Lillian Hellman living with her parents but keeping her wages of the Rogashevsky children we met at the tenement house who of course went out to work but brought their wages home as part of sustaining uh, a really subsistence level household economy. Exactly right and whereas boy children under the Rogashevsky circumstance might be able to retain a larger proportion of their income, the girl children almost universally just simply turned over their whole wage packet to their parents. But Hellman's parents, you know, by no means affluent, but reasonably, you know, middling income and okay, didn't need her wages, didn't want her wages. But the having of money in one's pocket, of course, immediately opens up a world that wasn't open to the Rogashevsky daughters, for example. And this distinction goes to something you talked about in the introduction that we'll hear you say more about in our next section, which is the way in which work means different things for different women. And of course, it's a reminder that our course is not about a universal women's work, but rather about the many ways in which women's work is constituted for many different women in different class, racial, ethnic, religious positions. I think that's a, a good point to interject here because, it, you know, it's it's possible, even though it's wrong, <laughs> to talk about working women as though they were a single unit. And even when we separate wage earning women from other kinds of workers, we nevertheless think of working women in a certain socioeconomic category, which is relatively poor. We don't think about working men that way. We think about working men as running the gamut from very rich to very poor. And now in the 1920s, we have just the beginning of the possibility of thinking that way. So that even those women who are quite well off and who choose, like Hellman, uh, to go out into the wage labor force rather than simply to be dependent on their families, and they do it, they do it for fun. You know, they do it for for satisfaction. They do it because they want to be engaged in some lively element. In Hellman's case, you know, she had sort of imagined herself as a writer but didn't really think that she could ever be a writer and then she went to work for a publishing company and she encountered all kinds of well-known um, uh, writers and went to parties with them and suddenly she had the aspiration to become a writer. So work for her, and she worked all of her life, it took on a very different meaning than work for the Rogashevsky children, for example, or even work for the, 
the young woman who, you know, could work and become a buyer in a retail store and therefore imagine herself living an independent and unmarried uh, life outside the normal family function.